The game that I'm about to discuss is one that seems to have been lost to time. One that many modern day Pokemon players have never experienced. A game that was criminally undersold, even though it was the first 3D Pokemon game to have its own Pokemon adventure. And I'm not talking about X and Y. The game I'm talking about is Pokemon Coliseum, my favorite Pokemon speedrun of all time. Now, I know this is a video about speedrunning Pokemon Coliseum, but to understand how speedrunning the game evolves the experience, we need to explore the game through its core gameplay experiences. For its time, and maybe even to this day, Coliseum is a very different Pokemon game. Exploring the more adult areas of the Pokemon franchise that only the manga ever dared to explore. Things like Pokemon attacking humans, a protagonist willing to steal Pokemon for the greater good, or even going as far as to blow up an evil villain's entire base. But I think it's in the glorious intro cutscene so different from other Pokemon games that you can see what makes this game so special to me and many others. Pokemon Coliseum starts off showing off not only a bunch of weird looking bald criminals, but soon after our epic protagonist, Wes who menacingly smiles as he betrays the evil villain team, Team Snagum. Team Snagum is a criminal organization founded around stealing Pokemon by using a machine called the Snag Machine, which becomes the tool centered around your entire adventure in Pokemon Coliseum. And as you progress past that crazy intro, you'll find that Team Snagum aren't the only evil villain team in this game. The other evil organization is called Cypher, and they've spread their villainy throughout the Ore region with a technology that makes Pokemon evil, all by corrupting and closing their hearts, creating what's called a Shadow Pokemon. Wes's job after finding out the dark nature behind the creation of Shadow Pokemon is to purify their corrupted hearts after stealing them away from random trainers and Cypher employees all with the immediate access of two fully evolved evolutions at the start of your adventure, and uh, I guess with the help of just secondary party member Rui. She's kind of just there after rescuing her. She can at least see the shadow Pokemon that you need to catch, but each time I go up some stairs or a really tight space, I see Rui and clearly she sees me trying to get up these stairs well actually there was that one time where she well we might not ever get to experience what it would have been like to join team rocket at the end of nugget bridge we'll at least get a taste for it in coliseum with the concept of stealing shadow pokemon before the existence of games such as Sun and Moon and Legends Arceus, a Pokemon game where Pokemon attack you, or a journey without gym badge progression was out of the question. And it's here where Pokemon Coliseum walked so Legends Arceus could run. Because Pokemon Coliseum was where that experience first came to life with its emphasis on shadow Pokemon and epic evil villain boss battles. You see, the concept of wild Pokemon doesn't actually exist in Colosseum. Instead, you'll be limited to stealing away shadow Pokemon throughout the entire game. And while this does lower the roster of Pokemon available to you, I can't help but feel that this isn't that big of a problem, especially with how popular Nuzlocke challenges are to the modern day Pokemon gamer, where you can only catch the first Pokemon on each route, making each teammate fun, different, and super valuable as you progress the game with the limitations set before you letting you experience using many Pokemon that you might not have ever used before. And that's the exact experience you have with the 51 Shadow Pokemon available throughout the game. However, what lends even better is what replaced both the gym badge and single battle system you've likely grown accustomed to in every main series Pokemon game. Because every battle in Pokemon Coliseum is a double battle. And if facing Tate and Liza as the seventh gym leader in the Hoenn region games was any sign of how difficult a double battle can get, then you ain't seen nothing yet. Each time that you visit the gritty Final Fantasy-like towns in the game, you'll also have to take on a big boss battle by the end of that town, the likes of which are on the same level of difficulty as Tate and Liza, but arguably worse. Let's take the third boss battle of the game against Dekim, for example. His entire team is based around abusing the move Earthquake, 
which in a double battle not only hurts your secondary teammate Pokemon, but both of your opponent's Pokemon as well with a 100 base power ground move. And in order to combat this without hurting his own Pokemon, most of his teammate Pokemon carry Protect, which lets this man dominate the battlefield with the strongest Earth move in the game without ever hurting his partner Pokemon. This forces you to fight strategy with strategy like a modern VGC battle, which is the format that Pokemon uses for competitive Pokemon. And much like a VGC battle, the Pokemon these boss battles will lead with will be unknown to you as their lead Pokemon are always chosen randomly. And it's because of this double battle system, crazy villain fights, and limited Pokemon availability that I would argue that this is the hardest official Pokemon game ever created. And it only gets harder from here when the trainers start bringing fully evolved and higher level Pokemon, like how the final boss of the game utilizes strategies such as using skill swap on Sly King to get rid of its really bad ability. So with this insanely challenging Pokemon game presented to us, how does speedrunning evolve this experience? By breaking it down to its core. The speed run for Pokemon Coliseum require very high stats on your starter Pokemon, to the point where it's about a 3% chance to even start a speed run without the help of RNG manipulation on Espeon. Espeon is a powerful Pokemon that dominates the speed run with really high speed, amazing special attack, and moves like Psychic, Hidden Power Grass, Protect, and Return. One of which is a physical move on a Pokemon that has really bad attack stat. The reason behind using this move is hidden in a mechanic you might not have noticed immediately, which is the battle animation system. Much like its console counterparts, Stadium 1 and 2, battle animations will always play without giving you the ability to turn them off or on. And it's in this decision to keep them on permanently that evolves the move picking aspect of battling for a speedrunner. Because now we have to take into account return being the fastest move in Espeon's move pool, or even how our other starter Pokemon, Umbreon, can stop enemy animations with taunt, making it so satisfying when they can't tail whip, leer, howl, or growl, letting you crush everything with Espeon the next turn while they can't do anything. But this evolution combo won't last for long, as there is a very special shadow Pokemon waiting to be stolen in the first big town of the game. It's here in Fennec City where you'll be acquainted with Rui for the first time after rescuing her from uh, being stuffed into a potato sack? Uh, followed by confronting the bald criminals, saying hi to the mayor, and meeting a ton of villains who really seem to enjoy gathering inside of the mayor's office? They'll leave his office pretty quickly after you enter, and it's here where a Johto starter shadow Pokemon of your choice will become available. But you can only pick one. And if my Johto speedrunning content is anything to go off of, the best and fastest of the three will never be Chikorita. <laughs> Get out of here. It'll be Quilava. Quilava is quite powerful and evolves into a Pokemon with the exact same base stats as Charizard. But the most important factor for choosing it is actually the speed of Quilava's battle animations. Previously, the speedrun had been done with Croconaw, but even with how amazing Surf is as a move, it's got a really slow animation that plays out multiple times per turn in a double battle. And because of how good it was at destroying the game, on top of daunting sections filled with ground and rock type Pokemon that are hard to KO for a fire Pokemon, Palava ended up becoming extremely underlooked. But with powerful and fast move animations like Flame Wheel, Fire Blast, Dig, and eventually Earthquake, it's easy to see why we switched over to the Hedgehog in the first place. To get all those moves I listed, however, you gotta earn them from a Shadow Pokemon. Because one key mechanic I waited till now to explain is the purification system in Pokemon Coliseum. In order for a Pokemon to unlock its full moveset, or even level up past the level that you caught it at, you have to purify its corrupted heart, which is a feature only available through the use of this magical stone that you can only reach after the first big boss fights of the game. And that's quite an undertaking when you only have a single move in your inventory. But that single move is one that I would describe as the most powerful move to ever exist in a Pokemon game. That move being Shadow Rush. 
Shadow Rush is a move that has zero resistances, and on top of that, a 95% chance to critical hit when a Shadow Pokemon goes into Hyper Mode which can only be activated by using Shadow Rush in the first place. Hyper Mode also comes with so many insane benefits on top of this crazy critical hit chance, like giving you the ability to use the Call feature, which is arguably the best way to get the Purification Meter down. But even with all these upsides, there's some pretty massive downsides to Hyper Mode. First off, if you use a move besides Shadow Rush while in Hyper Mode, your Pokemon will straight up disobey you. Sometimes going as far as to fall asleep, attack your own teammates, use an item without your permission, and so on and so forth. The second is that you can't directly use items on a Pokemon in Hyper Mode, forcing you to either call it out of Hyper Mode, then use an item, or use healing machines if you're too low on HP. And the last is your ability to purify a Pokemon quickly or even get into hyper mode in the first place is tied to the nature of your Pokemon. You see, each nature favors a certain method of getting your purification meter down, such as walking, sending out a Pokemon, using an item called an incense, or calling the Pokemon out of hyper mode. Adding so many layers of complication to purification. But when you're speed running to beat the game as fast as possible, this process becomes much easier to manage when the goal is centered around getting Quilava to become a Typhlosion. If with just Quilava, purification is definitely still a problem. But what really gets in the way of our speedrunning dreams will be shadow Pokemon like Furret. Normally, Furret is not a very threatening Pokemon. But oh my god, is this first battle after getting Quilava the true Gatekeeper to getting a speed run off of the ground? Because Gatekeeper Kale is one of those fights that are normally only hard to deal with for a speedrunner, like Hideki from Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire. Part of why this fight is so difficult is because of your need for a good nature and special attack on Quilava, which is not guaranteed since its stats can't be manipulated in the speedrun. However, the bigger challenge is surviving his hard-hitting Furret paired with a Ralts that knows the move in prison. The move in prison makes it so that Espeon can't use Confusion until Ralts faints, creating a massive problem when Quinlava gets into hyper mode immediately and doesn't take it out. Luckily, the guy does have random AI, but it's so easy for you to lose a run to a bad combination of unavoidable circumstances. The reason why we have to fight Kale in the first place is because he gives you one of the first clues about Cypher and their Shadow Pokemon, which lets you slowly learn of the existence of Cypher once you get past the Colosseum, go into this shady building, then finally inside of a cave on the roof of that building? All of which progress you into the meat of the story, where we'll be showcasing the best features used in a Pokemon Colosseum speedrun. And that is the glitches. Now, hold on. I know I may have lost some of you with the thought of corrupting the integrity of a speedrun with glitches. To that, I say, are we not already stealing our way to the end of the game for the greater good of the speedrun? Hell yes, we are. So glitches should be just as acceptable, especially since these glitches solve three problems we have to deal with throughout the game. One is the limited amount of money that you have. The next is the small number of Pokeballs you've obtained, and the final is that every Shadow Pokemon carries a valuable held item. The first Pokemon that we see in this cave is Shadow Metatite, that'll be holding onto a Twisted Spoon, an item that boosts Psychic-type moves when held by a Pokemon. This gives our Espeon such a massive boost to its power, but in order to catch it, we'll need to resort to the coolest glitch in Pokemon Coliseum, the Infinite Pokeball Glitch. In order to perform this glitch, you need at least two different types of Pokeballs in your bag. Then by throwing the first ball on your first Pokemon's turn, you can then go into your bag on your second Pokemon's turn and swap the positions of the two different Pokeballs. This makes it so the Pokeball you threw never gets used since you just swapped its position in the bag and can even be done with a Master Ball. But unfortunately, speedrunners will only have access to Great Balls and Pokeballs at this point which is fine for the Quilava and Metatite catches. And after catching Metatite for its spoon, we'll immediately swap that onto Espeon, sweep a bunch of grunts, then confront the most hilarious boss in the game, Mirror B. And it's during this fight that the second glitch comes in handy. When going into the fight with Mirror B, there are a few things you need to know. 
The first is that this man has four different Ludicolo, all of which are different levels and can be randomly sent out as a lead Pokemon. The second is that much like Dakim, he has a strategy that he loves to go for, and that strategy is making sure Rain is always up on the field, which gives us the opportunity to set up using the second glitch. To activate this glitch, we need to target a secondary Pokemon with an item that can't be used on them, such as a revive when a Pokemon is alive or a full heal when a Pokemon is in status. You can then clear the text that tells you you can't use this item, followed by using an X item afterwards. This lets you use X items on that secondary Pokemon that you just targeted with that item that can't be used, which is a feature that didn't exist in double battles until later generations of Pokemon. And to be able to abuse that feature in a game filled with only double battles is an insane tool to have access to. Because now, you can just focus on blasting your opponent into oblivion with one Pokemon while using the other to set up that Pokemon into the ultimate blaster. It's such an insane glitch and really becomes the bread and butter for dealing with these boss battles in a speedrun. Adding so much more strategy to each fight, especially when every single boss has a pattern to it. And I could go on and on with how these boss fights can be broken down all day, especially taking into account the final portion of the game where you're forced into a massive tower that has you re-battling every one of those ridiculous boss fights, but with even stronger Pokemon on their team. This game seriously just doesn't stop, and it's part of what I love about speedrunning Colosseum, because it takes that self-limitation aspect that I love so much from a Nuzlocke challenge the insane boss battles that I adore from other RPGs and packages that into the ultimate Pokemon game. And while these strategies could be used in a Nuzlocke, regular playthrough, or shiny shadow Pokemon hunt, the aspects that only speedrunning can provide is what makes Pokemon speedrunning such a special experience like no other. While Pokemon may not be a flashy speedrun like Mario 64 or Breath of the Wild, it's in the core strategies and menus that need to be performed at a moment's notice. The good and bad RNG that keeps everything fresh. Being able to blast through everything with some of the coolest Pokemon ever made. And the satisfaction that you put everything together. You made it this far and you did it in the fastest way possible. All through the journey of a Pokemon speedrun.